Thank you all for joining us today for our inaugural webinar on the OGs of elder justice. I'm Lori Mars, Deputy Director of the National Center on Elder Abuse. The National Center on Elder Abuse is one of nine elder justice resource centers funded by the Administration for Community Living. We're housed at the Keck School of Medicine of USC and provide the latest information and resources on research, training, policy, and best practices on intervention and elder mistreatment. Today's webinar will kick off our podcast series featuring the OGs of elder justice. These brief, candid conversations with pioneers in the field will explore their groundbreaking journeys and meaningful collaborations while forging the path to elder justice. I'm so honored to introduce today's outstanding OGs, M.T. Connolly and Dr. Laura Mosqueda. M.T. Connolly is a national expert on elder justice, a MacArthur Genius Grant awardee, architect of the Federal Elder Justice Act, founder of the Department of Justice's Elder Justice Initiative and lead author of the Elder Justice Roadmap. Dr. Mosqueda is an international authority on elder maltreatment, the director of the National Center on Elder Abuse and professor of family medicine and geriatrics at the Keck School of Medicine of USC. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping matters. Please submit your questions in the chat and Q&A boxes. So we'll try to get to your questions today, given the brief format, we might, may not be able to respond during the webinar. To enable the live transcript feature, please click the CC button on your screen, and recording will be made available through the National Center on Elder Abuse. At the end of today's webinar, you'll receive a survey link. Please complete the survey and provide your feedback. I'd now like to turn to M.T. Connolly to begin the discussion. Thanks so much, Laurie, for setting this up. And hello, Laura. Um, we thought we would start with how we met. Um, so it was 2000, the year 2000. Um, and I was working for the Department of Justice. And we wanted to have an event relating to the, um, the medical forensics of elder abuse. There had never been an event on that. And indeed, it was a kind of new idea. And I wanted to find a lawyer and a doctor to co-facilitate this event. Um, and, you know, Department of Justice is swarming with lawyers. So that was not a problem. But finding a doctor was a little bit more of an issue because I wanted a doctor who had several attributes, somebody who had expertise in abuse, um, somebody who had um expertise working across disciplines and knew how to sort of do that shape shifting. Um, and so a bunch of calls led me to none other than Laura Mosqueda. Um, and the one other thing I'll say is that when you're in, putting together a party and a, a small party and it includes the attorney general, People tend to find time on their schedules. And what I learned was that Laura was not only very knowledgeable about elder abuse, but also had a good sense of time and a good sense of humor, both of which are integral to events like this. So that's that's my first volley. Laura, you're on mute. Speaking of which, I vividly remember uh, when we were trying to figure out how we were going to get people to keep time that MT uh, borrowed lights from the Supreme Court, was able to get over there and, and borrow their, their lights in order to keep people on time, which was a lot of fun. But, you know, I, I, what really strikes me about that, uh, and by the way, that was the year 2000 ACE, correct? <laughs> Just to be clear. And... Uh, it, it really stimulated the first national conversation on this topic. I think there were like bits and pieces of us working in different areas. I got to meet Mark Lax and David Hoffman and the wonderful Carmel Dyer, may she rest in peace, and Carl Pillimer and Candace Heisler. And, and even you even brought a pediatrician, Wendy, right there. And 23 years later, a lot of us are still working together, which is amazing. And I think a real tribute to you and your strategic thinking. And I am now actually going to put you on the spot, genius M.T. Connolly, certified genius, uh, and ask why you wrote this book, The Measure of Our Age. And don't be limited to a 30-second answer on this one. I think, a, you know, 
take all of three minutes for a more nuanced <laughs> for a more nuanced response. But take a few minutes to tell us why you wrote uh, the measure of our age. Um. Well, as with many things, it was born of disappointments, really. I mean, I'd always wanted to write a book, but the reason I wrote this book was because of the disappointing results of my work, really. Um, you know, when I was at the Department of Justice, um, I tried to create an Office of Elder Justice. That didn't work. And then, you know, went to the Senate in 2002, helped to draft the Elder Justice Act. And then that, you know, we had really powerful members from both sides of the aisle um, that were co-sponsors. And so Lauren Fuller and I thought, oh, the thing was going to sail through. Um, and in fact, it did not. It languished for many years and eventually was enacted with the Affordable Care Act in 2010. But there was no appropriation to fund it until 2015. And then only really quite piddling amounts for the next five years. There was a brief bolus of money. Um, as part of the COVID relief funds. And then after those COVID relief funds um, ran out, it's gone back to really very trifling amounts. And so I wanted to understand at a deeper level, what's going on? You know, the Violence Against Women Act, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, those that are laws that are attended by a lot of funds, a lot of programs, there's robust federal infrastructure to implement them. That's not the case with elder justice. Why not? Um, and so what I ended up doing was in part, and this is really part three of the book, which focuses on how change happens, to look at the Elder Justice Act as, um, as a case study for both how change doesn't happen, and then to look at how change does happen with big social programs, um, big social pro big social problems. Like how, what are the mechanics of movement building, of change? Because one of the things that I learned was that we don't really have political power in the elder justice field. Um, and that in the end, a lot of change is driven by having political power. Um, but then, uh, working with my editors, um, my editors said, you know, we want this to be a broader book. We want it to be also a book for the general public. And we have to, and they really wanted me to provide some guidance to what are the challenges that people run into in aging. And that, um, you know, I, I, it was a hard thing to do to write in plain language with stories that really to write nonfiction, um, it, you want to be grounded in stories, stories of um, stories of all kinds of different people. Um, and so it, you know, the, the, trying to write about issues like caregiving, of which there are 50 million caregivers in the United States who get precious little either attention or support, about the financial challenges in aging, about autonomy safety challenges. Um, about the challenges in finding decent long-term care. Um, and then also in our social norms, you know, in other times in history and in other cultures, we have elevated older people um, and really appreciated older people. And we live in a very ageist society um, where the norms of aging often are either isolation or segregation by age with a whole lot of ageism sprinkled in, which I believe also is a driver of elder abuse. That ageism is really a driver of elder abuse. So really trying to unpack all that in a way that would resonate for the public. You know, like all the experience where we go to Thanksgiving dinner and your aunt says, what do you do? And you're like, oh God, how do I explain it? And so I wanted a book that helps explain to our aunts and our families and our friends, like what is it that we work on? Because really the people working in the elder justice field work often in obscurity and invisibility when in fact they're doing unbelievably important work. So just to sum up, I think that the book is a love letter in a sense to the elder justice field. It also is trying to help the general public understand some of the challenges of aging, help us translate that into language that policy 
makers might be willing to act on. And then also maybe most important to say, what are the good things? What matters most in aging that we too often overlook? Well, so. and, and it says a lot about you that, you know, I think a lot of other people having, I, I remember how hard you worked on the Elder Justice Act and, you know, nights and weekends and all that sort of stuff and what you poured into it. And I think it says a lot about you that you took that disappointment and instead of like picking up your things and going home, you, it actually motivated you to do even more and help figure out priorities and, and all that. And that, that's, that's pretty darn good. Well, thank you. But I'm also really grateful to the people who continued to advocate, who include many listeners today, um, and, you know, who really did continue to push. Because I do believe that the Elder Justice Act did a lot of good and continues to do a lot of good. Um, just not, <laughs> it just didn't live up to the grandiose expectations, perhaps. And as a footnote, um, the book also has everything you always wanted to know about Laura Mosqueda and several other luminaries in the elder justice field, but we're afraid to ask, but I won't include any spoilers. Uh, uh, th thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the spoilers, you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the spoilers. Uh, so um, what, when we think about priorities for the field, um, I, I think your book laid out a few. Do you want to? take a run at it and then maybe I will too, or? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, so I think there are four priorities in my mind that, that really became more apparent to me in my research and writing. Um, one of them is intervention research, which really is just a fancy way of saying, we wanna know what works and we wanna ask what works. And so that we have the best <laughs> to offer um, the people we're trying to serve. Um, and I believe that the more human and financial capital we devote to an intervention, the more important it is to test it and to see what the impact is. Um, second is prevention research. Um, you know, we call a lot of stuff prevention when we have no clue whether it actually prevents anything at all. Um, and we are never, ever going to report, investigate, or prosecute our way out of elder abuse. It's a big social problem. We need to have tools that we know are effective along the lines of seatbelts and smoking cessation to give to the public, to give to professionals, and to give to policymakers. Um, and, and that leads to the next one, which is that we need to look at the programs that we do know work. And we have some preliminary exciting developments of that in a, a program that Laura has worked on called Coach and a program I've worked on called Rise. But we need to figure out how to scale the programs that we do know work. And then fourth, I think we need to do more to take on ageism actually, and in ourselves and as a society, because it is a driver of elder mistreatment. And it means that too often we lose track of what matters most as we age because the policy, you know, because we're so occupied with so much else. Yeah. You know, and one comment I have about the scaling up, and this is, this is like sort of the fun you and I have, I think uh, in some of our conversations is scaling up also scares me because I think so much of that is local. And so uh, that would be a great conversation for all of us as a field to have at another time uh, as well. Agreed. Okay, your priorities, Laura. <laughs> My priorities are to talk about scale. No. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I think it's really important for us to really start understanding how interconnected everything is. Because, you know, while we're there advocating for elder justice and funding and all that, I think that we also need to at the same time advocate for better societal supports, more works in all forms of family violence. I, I don't think there's much doubt now that one of the best ways to prevent elder abuse is to prevent child abuse. So we all need to like hold hands on this. Fighting ageism, I think is really important because elder abuse doesn't exist in a vacuum. And so I think really understanding that is important. I think also how we respond uh, is is a high priority. Maybe this is a good time. You know, look, we have now some accumulated knowledge and research from the past 20 years or so. Um, so we have more science, we have more experience. Maybe this is a time to start reimagining APS and the long-term care ombudsman programs to really take advantage of what of what we've learned. So I think that would be a priority as well. And then, of course, not that this is self-serving or anything, but more geriatrics and gerontology. I think that that 
issues related to aging need to be taught to everyone everywhere, not necessarily all at once, but everyone <laughs> everywhere at some point um, so that we have a, a really better understanding um, of, of aging. And I think that's one of the ways to combat ageism. Um, and this actually reminds me of an important lesson that I've learned from UMT, which is we need a big tent. And I think that's what you did back when you organized that um, meeting with, with um, Attorney General Reno. You didn't just invite lawyers or doctors or even geriatricians, but you invited a lot of different people um, from different fields. And I think that the idea that that um, here you have this incredible background in law and policy and completely different than my background in medicine, but we have a lot of what I call peanut butter cup moments of like, you know, chocolate and peanut butter coming together, making something really delicious. Uh, because we, I think over the years have, have worked together. And one thing that I think sometimes is an impediment, frankly, in our field is we fall over ourselves. You and I don't do this, but people we know to be polite. Uh, and so <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, you don't. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Nobody's ever accused me of being polite. And uh, but I and I do think, of course, we want to be polite and respectful to each other. But it doesn't mean you can't disagree or argue. And one of the things I have really appreciated is that we we really are able to do that with each other. We found ways to argue and disagree that are respectful and dare I say fun when we kick things around. And I think like the fact that you've challenged my thinking um, have really helped guide my perspectives and change my perspectives. Um, and I think, hey, who knew that trust and friendship are uh, key ingredients to dreaming up new ideas and new programs and figuring out implementation. Um, so, I mean, working, working together has been a real joy for me. Yeah, it's, um, ditto. I don't admit that everywhere, <laughs> but, um, you know, one definition of leadership that I really like is that essentially it's trying to seek out people who are really different from you are, who have different skill sets and different experiences and different ways of thinking. Um, and there's pretty, pr you know, it's a, pretty well proven thing that if you have different skill sets at the table, you come up with a broader array of potential solutions. And I think, but it does require a few things. It requires curiosity um, and it requires not taking things personally. Like, you know, I can tell everybody and anybody who's worked with Laura knows this. She'll say, well, why, why is that true? Why? W like, what makes you think that? And it's important to really try to let that seep in because I think that is also the source of innovation. Like, how do we, how do we, how, why do we think the way we do? Why do we have the programs that we do? Why do we think they work? And so it is a, both a way of expanding our own consciousness, but also a way of testing our best ideas. Like a lot of the stuff we do is based on just our beliefs or our, you know, our, our, our experience as opposed to really trying to test it. And so that is something I really appreciate because you make me think bigger and more rigorously. Um, and in writing about you, I will say that, you know, one of the weird things about writing nonfiction is that the people you're writing about turn into characters. And so I have this weird kind of double thing with Laura where she's both a colleague and a friend, but also a character. And so I have to think about like, what is it uh, in your work that is meaningful and that might be interesting to readers to learn about? And how have you moved the field and the way we think about elder justice? And so I think there are three different things. These are just examples, um, but in sort of different domains. One of them is knowledge building. So from that very first event in 2000, Laura's like, bruises, what makes me think that some bruises are suspicious and others aren't? So she took that question and turned it into a research project that became groundbreaking research that has informed thousands of people for many years now. Second is that team building capacity, like 
we were talking about forensic centers. Hilariously, we were talking about mobile forensic centers that is still in like the finance yeah. committee's markup of the of the Elder Justice Act. That did not happen. But Laura created a forensic center in 2003 with like a press release and really diverse, I mean, a press conference and really diverse partners learning the power of team building um, and of funding from the Archstone Foundation, actually. Um, and by the way, also learning at that press conference that the district attorney at the time didn't know what APS stood for. That was fun. Right. Well, and 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 that press conferences are actually a draw for public officials. That is the way to get them to the table. So that's a whole other side story. But then also conceptual models, which I think don't get enough attention. Like we're in an under theorized field, but Laura took something called the AIM model, the abuse intervention model. And what people don't know, at least it, it appeared, you know, like Athena from Zeus's head in an article. But in fact, she'd been noodling around with it for years and years, trying to say, what is it that I see that can help others understand what's going on when there is elder mistreatment? And so that is the, the curiosity and the tenacity, I think, are really important contributors in terms of what you've done, but also as a writer, you speak in vivid images and that's what you want as a writer. So for example, leafy sea dragons, you know, like you can't see them until you know what they look like. So Laura puts up these two slides. The first slide, you can't see anything. And the second, then she shows you a picture of a leafy sea dragon swimming in open water. And then this, then when you see it amid the seaweed, you can see it. And so that's a really vivid example um, for which I'm grateful to you. Well, you know, and I think it also shows the importance for all of us of like getting out in the world a little bit too. And uh, uh, if we have time, we could talk a little bit more about this, just about the importance of, you know, I came up with that metaphor because I'm an avid scuba diver and I love marine biology. And so it's, it's sort of back to what you were talking about earlier, like bringing in different things and different fields and different ideas helps all of us in ways, you know, that we wouldn't, that we wouldn't anticipate. I, I would say with you, you're like the ultimate connector. I still remember uh, that book by, uh, what's, what's his name? We talked about connections. Uh, I'm forget blanking on the name of the Gladwell. author. What's that? Gladwell? I don't know. Yeah. Yes, Gladwell. Look at how useful and helpful you are. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and like, it, it was almost about you because you you know more people than I've like you probably know more people in 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 a week than that I've that I've known in my whole life but you're super generous about like sharing and connections and and really strategic and in introducing people to each other and when I think about some of my good friends and colleagues who I work with now all because of you who've enriched like not only my professional life but my personal life as well that's pretty cool, and I think that's what happens uh, when it, when uh, when folks have been working together in different ways for for a long time. You know, uh, there's that old game called uh, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon that anyone in a film can be uh, linked to Kevin Bacon within six steps. Uh, I, I think that in Elder Justice, there's like two degrees of M.T. Connolly uh, that, that somehow any of us could get linked to you in in two steps because you've just brought us all together in, in so many smart and strategic and uh, warm ways. It's been remarkable. But when I think about all the impacts you've had on the field, your book, The Measure of Our Age, takes the cake uh, because it's just a culmination of so much work and thought and sweat over these past 25 years. And when I see the impact it's already having, I. I, uh, you and I had done a, a, a radio piece together locally in Los Angeles, and one of my neighbors heard it and went, oh my God, that sounds fantastic. So I gave her a book and she loved it. And she said it started a conversation in her household and her sister is a death doula in Ohio and she mailed it to her sister. So I think the impact is already there from it and that it's only going to grow as more people read it. But uh, I know that you're you're one of the most humble people I've met, but it's got to feel kind of cool to know that you've started these conversations in families and in, in, in communities with your book. No. Um, I will say I 
hope that the book is a conversation starters, whether a conversation starter, whether it's just a conversation in our own heads or in our families or among friends or in communities or with our policymakers to, to hold them to account and say, this is not acceptable or this is something we would like to try to replicate. Um, but I do, I feel a little bit like, um, I don't know what the word is, you know, <laughs> uh, 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 the skunk at a dinner party sometimes, because inevitably when, when I'm with friends, we end up talking about like, do you want to live in a group setting? Do you want to live alone? What are you, you know, care, et cetera. But so, and that's really exciting to me because I feel like there is so much to be gained if we start having the conversations that are about longevity that are so long overdue and not just for older people, but for everybody everywhere. Yeah. Not all at once. <laughs> not all at once. <laughs> well, I am incredibly grateful for our longstanding, uh, friendship and trust and, and the work that we've done together and are con going to continue to do together. And I see, I see Lori Mars has magically reappeared. I have, and I'm so reluctant to, uh, to intervene in this incredible conversation, but we do have a question in the chat, an interesting one related to the New Yorker cover uh, the, from this week, featuring the cartoon of older politicians with walkers and uh, Lisa Fur has asked if you could speak to this in regards to ageism and why politicians vote against things that benefit older adults. Well, I, I know we only have a moment, but MT, it might be interesting to talk about, like, is it okay to talk about our different reactions? Um, yeah, sure. Talk about yours and then- uh, Okay, you know, so it was interesting because because she and I were talking about that this cover <laughs> this weekend. So I saw it and I was horrified. Um, and um, I'll leave it at that just because our time is short. Um, and I was trying to figure out how to feel about it. I mean, I feel like it, it certainly sends a mixed message. And I was upset that there were no tennis balls on any of the walkers um, and that there weren't any of the updated walkers that I've learned more about, Laura, you know, like the ones that have colors and seats and all that. Um, so I was, but the thing about outrage is that I don't know, like I want to, I want there to be outrage about the policies we have and that we don't help caregivers and that we don't have a better long-term care system and we don't have any way to, we don't have any coherent long-term care insurance. Um, and so I, I feel like, yes, and I, I want the New Yorker to do more on those issues. Yeah, and I love so that I, point. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just love that point that I hadn't thought about, which is like, everybody's getting all upset about this. And, and like I told you, I was horrified by it. I don't know if I was outraged, but I was horrified. And, and then you bring up, yeah, but let's, let's get horrified and outraged by the real stuff that's going on as well. And so for me, that was like a nice example of, of us talking about things. <laughs> well, th thank you. Right. And so she much. didn't shame me, by the way, she didn't shame me for not being outraged. I mean, I was I was confused, actually. I was confused about how to feel is the truth, um, because, yes, well, whatever. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm only going to go ahead, Lori. Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We wish we had more time on this, but we do have one final question that we're posing of all our OGs in our uh, upcoming podcasts as well. What is a key principle that guides you professionally and personally? I'll let the MacArthur Genius recipient go first. Yeah, whatever. It's um, so fun to harass her about that. So um, I try to guide how I, where I put my time and attention on what matters most. Like I really try to do the math and it was really writing the last chapter of my book that has caused me to reframe how I, where I put my attention. So um it, and it, when it when when it comes to elder justice stuff, it's like where is there a fundamental gap in knowledge or practice that I feel like I could help do something about? And often that means putting together a team to do something about it. You know, like our Rise team. So I think that's that. Where is there a fundamental gap in knowledge or practice in terms of what really matters in change? And then, but I use the same thing for myself. Doctor, um, so for me, I would say it's it's what I've really learned is to take the long view, um, and that 
if I really want to contribute to making the world a better place, which I'd like to do just a little bit, that it, for me, it's really important to be aware of my words and my thoughts and, and actions to the extent I can every minute of every day, because they all have ripple effects that go on for years. So this idea about the long view and understanding how things are connected are important uh, principles to me. Thank you both so much for this incredible, robust conversation. Um, I wish it went on longer, um, but you're always leaving us with more. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, please stay tuned uh, for upcoming podcasts in the OG series. The first one will feature Dr. Georgia Annetsberger. We're also excited to announce that the Judith D. Tampkin Symposium on Elder Abuse will take place next February 23rd, 22nd through 23rd in Pasadena, California. We have an outstanding agenda and lineup of speakers, including M.T. Connolly, uh, and we'll be addressing lots of topics, including financial exploitation, caregiving, person-centered trauma-informed care, and the latest evidence-based interventions. Uh, registrations, registration links are available online. And on behalf of the NCEA, we thank our panelists and we thank you all for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day.